Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Time for this week's uh, real life interviews and a real special one. We've got not just one guy, but we've got two guys. We've got a helicopter pilot, OH-58 and AH-64. And as well as that, we've got one of his very good buddies, a mechanic on the AH-64. We've got Dustin, who is the pilot, and we've got Pale, who's the mechanic. Sorry for the kind of derogatory term mechanic. It's just, it just, I don't know, it sort of works and... I used to be a mechanic, so it makes sense. That's a badge of honor. Badge of honor, exactly. You got that. And so what we're going to do now is go through... We've only got Dustin's, the, the pilot's bio, and then we can talk about Pale as well as we go on. CW4, just in case. Is CW4 a rank, by the way, guys? Uh, yes, sir. It's a uh, chief warrant officer. Understood. In 1997, I joined the U.S. Army as an engineer equipment repair man in the Army Reserve component. As soon as I learned about becoming a warrant officer at an Army flight school, I applied and was accepted in 2001. Wow, that's a long time ago. After attending warrant officer candidate school, I first flew the military version of the Bell 206, which was one that we were going to get in DCS, guys, wasn't it? But we never got. For primary and instrument flight training. I then flew the O. H-58, that's the Kiowa, isn't it, guys? Usually not Kiowa. referred to as a Kiowa. What was that? What's the 58, guys? Have I got that completely wrong? It's the earlier version, the Alpha Charlie. The A. Right, okay, right. I'll take your word for that, boys. Uh, for basic combat skills training, and the AH-64D Apache for advanced aircraft training. I have almost 3,000 hours in the AH-64D, and most recently about 300 hours in the AH-64E. As a hobby not associated with military aviation, I'm an instrument-rated single-engine aircraft pilot. Okay, I would like to keep my units of assignment and specific deployment dates off the public record for obvious reasons. Uh, in general, I have deployed five times to Iraq and Afghanistan combined. I have almost five years of time in theatre spread out from 2004 to 2015. In that time, I trained and worked as a tactical operations officer, now called a mission survivability officer, and as a maintenance test pilot. Most of my experience is as a maintenance test pilot. I have several years of experience troubleshooting, repairing and test flying Apache helicopters. Maintenance test pilots are also maintenance officers for the Army. Later in my career, I worked as a battalion maintenance officer where I was principally responsible for managing a maintenance program and a fleet of 24 Apaches. Currently, I work for the US Army Aviation Center of Excellence uh, as I recognize that. Do we have someone else from there? Uh, as doctrine developed uh, in the Directorate of Training and Doctrine Trust, saying that when you're drunk, I primarily work on preparing and or revising training circulars and techniques, techniques publications for training, maintenance and sustainment to current and future aviation maintainers. I sort of understood that, but that's all very good, guys. Now, before we start going into the uh, the viewer questions, anything uh, from Dustin or Pale? I'd just like to say thanks, man. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Of course. Uh, and, it, and I'd have to say up front that anything I say is my personal opinion, and I'm not representing officially the U.S. Army or my organization. Of course. Roger, anything from Pale? Uh, yep, again, love the channel, Cap. Been a fan a long time. Appreciate the opportunity and, and echo uh, Dustin's remarks that these are my opinions and not that of the U.S. government. Beautiful, guys. Okay, let's crack on. Okay, as usual, we've put this bio out to you, the public, and you, the public, have asked the following questions. They've not been checked, so we'll just see how it goes. Number one, uh, pilot or maintainer. So for the pilot, how lethal is is the 30 mil cannon so you're going to have to answer that however you want and however you want to quantify that yeah so lethal is a really subjective term right uh first off it's not a gal 8 a lot of i know there's a lot of a10 mm -hmm. enthusiasts on your channel mm -hmm. the, the m230 cannon is not is not a gal 8 it's a much smaller cartridge and a lower velocity okay. uh in general it's an he round and it has typical you know high explosive effects a little bit of fragmentation and it has some uh, pretty mild armor penetration capabilities. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, armor would we penetrate out of interest? I had no idea. I assumed it would carry HE and or AP but it's HE only. So what is the largest kind of armor that you would bother employing against? If you're uh, allowed to answer. It's it's made for like I said mild, mild armor so mm -hmm. 
uh, it's not going to shoot something uh, like a, well, you wouldn't use it to shoot a, a T-90 tank. That's mm-hmm. not what it's for. Uh, it's more of a anti-personnel, uh, you know, soft skin radars or something mm. like that. Roger. Okay. Just looking at pictures now, it looks like something from the future and it's awesome. Okay. Do anyone know, is, is this comparable to the KA-50 cannon? Anyone know? I'm guessing it is, but I don't suppose anyone's going to know that, are they? Okay. It's such a cool topic. I want to talk more, but I can't think of anything else in the gun. Anyone want to ask about the gun? I've seen, I've seen kind of pictures of... Um, uh, a rack of just kind of explosions. What, any, what, do we know what kind of rate of fire this thing has? Yeah, it, it's uh, something like 600 rounds a minute. 625 plus or minus that's 25. A, that's a lot, isn't it? That's like assault rifle. That's a lot. Da, 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 da. Very cool, guys. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty wicked. Uh, yeah, there are, there are a lot of Gulf War videos, videos uh, that, that show the cannon I- in action. Yeah, all you some see... Of the, some of the ones, the very first missions uh, that were flown uh, in the Gulf War, where mm-hmm. they took out patches after the radar sites, you can see the oh, really? cannon there. Well, okay, for anyone, feel free to send me links through this, and I can put them up on the screen, but yeah. How, sorry, Kat. Send, Obi. Okay. I was going to say, how quickly does the um, the cannon mount rotate when you look around? Is there a lag in between where you look and the cannon catches up, or is it pretty quick? Uh, it's pretty quick. Uh, Pell, you want to talk about how how many crew chiefs have had their knees taken out? <laughs> yes, yeah, we have to be careful because he can uh, actually slave. Uh, as you said, uh, the gun will can follow his head, and so when we're out down there working with the pilot, maybe to load it, maybe to work through something. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the pilot unwillingly looks left or right, or if one of us gets in the danger zone, um, you can imagine the uh, damage it, mm-hmm. can, it can cause. So I, I would I would say that I don't know of any lag. Do you, Dustin? It's it's no, pretty it's, much real time. It's all it's fa- as fast as the it, it's as fast as it needs to be to keep up with your head. Mm-hmm. 120 degrees per second. Yeah, well, that's pretty much as much as you're ever going to want, isn't it? Okay, wiki guys. Yeah, really poor, cool piece of kit. I'm sure we'll come back to it, but very good. Okay, let's crack on. Um, question two for both of you guys. Why do you think the AH-64 was never equipped with an ejection seat, similar to the KA-50? And do you think it would be possible to add one in the future? Go ahead, Chuck. So, fascinating question. It comes up often uh, within our internal community. Um, we- so the bottom line is we don't know why it was never equipped. Uh, that decision would have made, been made in the early 80s, late 70s. Uh, uh, he, he and I do work with the current uh, requirements. So the Army has every have requirements for an aircraft in the acquisition system. And so no doubt it was added to the board, you know, like it, it needs to have this, it needs to have, you know, a kitten with a laser on it. You, you throw everything on the board, but you have to have trade space, right? Everything mm-hmm. on a helicopter is weight. Um, and then I will tell you from a maintenance perspective, and me and, and Dustin had talked about this, is a fascinating question. We talked about this before the interview is, is I'm, and I'll let him speak to it, but as a maintainer, it's, I can't imagine what goes into that. And you got to imagine an ejection seat is, is heavier. Mm-hmm. So, uh, there would have to be some studies done on the cost benefit of it. And uh, the, uh, it, again, we, we don't know the answer. It is fascinating. Um, and maybe I, I, and as we go forward with future vertical lift, I'm sure they'll consider it. Uh, but whether it'll make it to the final uh, product is uh, yet to be seen. Mm. I, can, I can tell you there's definitely a mental aspect to it. Uh, just as me with my experience, that would be some spooky uh you know, I, I don't know if I would want to sit in an ejection seat mm-hmm. in a helicopter with rotor blades spinning over my head. Mm-hmm. That's a fair point, isn't it? So on the K50, they blow off, don't they, guys? The rotors. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm, interesting. Okay. Very interesting question. I've never, never even thought about it, guys. So basically, if you get shot, you're expected to go down with a ship. <laughs> That's fine. It's my kind yeah, of. Yeah, they make it very survivable. Well, I, was I, mean, think, a... I, I was thinking. I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Okay, they haven't got ejection seats. Have they therefore compensated for that with extra survivability in, say, redundant systems in, say, crash structures? Not the foggiest. Any answers to that, guys? Y- yeah, for sure. It, uh, almost every system on the helicopter is duplicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's extremely redundant. And uh, if you look at some historical examples, like in you know the battles we fought early in Iraq in two thousand three. Uh, almost all of them came back. Right. I mean, you're pretty much expected to get shot at by small arms fire, aren't you? Something that's going to move relatively slowly, relatively low. 
yeah, it's 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 part of the plan. Mm. Okay, very good, guys. Okay, now let's push on. Question three for both of you. Did you have a passion for aviation and a goal for serving in the military as an aviator in some some capacity, or did it just fall on your lap? After so many flight hours, did it become another mundane part of the job, or is it always exciting to be in the cockpit? Uh, so it definitely did not fall in my lap. Uh, it, it's a tremendous amount of work. Just to apply to flight school took me months, probably, I don't remember exactly, four or five months of paperwork and mm. trying to find the right people and going to the right places, and you definitely have to work for it. Uh, it, it, it certainly requires some passion. Uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, after a number of years, it does become a job, uh, but I still love it. Roger. Anything pale? Um, so I wanted to join the Air Force. Well, my dad was in the military, so I wanted to join the military. Uh, but my dad said I had to get a skill because he was a ranger, and mm -hmm. um, that although that's a skill that you can't transfer to civilian life. So I tried to join the Air Force. I had a bit of a childhood uh, rap sheet, and so I, I had to join the Army. And uh, you're literally sitting in a seat, and they give you like some options. You want to work on generators? Do you want to, you know, work on computers? Oh, do you want to work on helicopters? And you're literally like making this mm -hmm. life decision. And I've always loved aviation, so I chose it and uh, haven't looked back and really enjoy it and like you said so, yeah some days it's a job but i think uh, we try to pinch ourselves every once in a while because we do realize like it, it is one of the most advanced attack helicopters in the world and mm -hmm. and he and i have been very fortunate to be on some of the cutting edge uh we're to the point in our careers where we get to work with the engineers about what's next what's new and how to make it better and so although maybe the day-to-day -day stuff can become mundane, it's always exciting when you're working with the future fleet and, and how you can make it better and, do, and be part of that and, and be able to look back on it and go, hey, I helped you know steer that capability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where he and I get have a lot of our passion and we work, uh, we still do that today. All right, guys, very good. Okay, let's push on. Four, how bad was the headache caused by the eye-mounted uh, Apache display? And for, for the noobs out there, can you explain what, what we're talking about, please? The uh, display. Yeah, uh, it, it can be pretty bad. Uh, so the, the helmet uh, has a mount for a helmet-mounted display. It covers your right eye. Uh, I'm sure you can find it on Google. Yeah, just check uh, I would uh, maybe try IHADSS. I H A D S S. I H A D S S. Uh, that's yeah. Good. Oh, how about uh, that. So you can see that, uh, and that's how we get the video display for. Uh, so Apache is very similar to some of the, the fixed wing stuff that you guys already have experience mm -hmm. with in DES, like such as a flight path vector. Mm -hmm. uh, that would appear in your helmet mounted display. Uh, and also FLIR video at night. Mm hmm. Uh, but it can it, so another similarity uh, to the VR goggles. I'm sure mm. if you wear if you've worn VR goggles, you've had a headache, right? Uh, because if you don't get them adjusted correctly, it's it's killer. Uh, the focal length and the mm. diopter length are critical. Uh, uh, but if you get it adjusted correctly, uh, you can, you can't even tell. Uh, I've worn it for I don't know six or eight hours mm. without uh, having to take it off. Uh, you do have to constantly adjust it to sort of let your eye relax. Interesting. I'd love to. I'd love to. St I can't really imagine. But is it like eye strain, something along those lines? Yeah. If if it's not adjusted correctly, the muscles in your eye are trying to compensate for hmm. uh, the, the the whatever the fault is. If if the focal hmm. link is too far away, or if you don't have it lined up correctly in front of your eye, uh, if your eye is trying to compensate and doing a lot of work then you're going to get a headache if if you have it adjusted correctly and it's it's uh, naturally aligned correctly then then you're pretty well off you're not going to have a problem roger okay very good does this uh this piece eyepiece also contain the kind of like if you crosshairs for the gun is this what's linked to the gun yeah so basically everything you need for flying and fighting the aircraft minus a, f a few options that are available to the front seat gunner uh, is it can be displayed in there? Uh, altitude, airspeed, radar altitude, uh, heading. It's it's. Uh, if you look at that first one at the top left there, you can see a little bit of the symbology. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like the uh, uh, helmet mounted display mm -hmm. in the F eighteen mm -hmm. in DCS when they mm -hmm. first introduced that in VR. Mm -hmm. 
they correctly put it only on one of your eyes and mm -hmm. in fact you can choose in the options whether you want to see it both eyes mm -hmm. left eye or right eye mm -hmm. but when it first came in it wasn't optional it was just i think your right eye and that really got you some getting used to i mean i had all sorts of problems headache mm -hmm. problems with, with that until I eventually got the hang of using it mm -hmm. it's, it's very different yeah, i can tell Are you uh, the uh, so we have the option to fly goggles and and the helmet mounted display is basically situational independent the pilot's choice uh and the goggles ca cause far more problems than the hdu the helmet mounted display mm. uh, it's, it's, it's much harder to adjust them correctly and they're heavier and they're, they're just more more uh difficult mm. more less comfortable mm -hmm. have they upgraded them with the different versions of the apache or is it still you know 1980s technology the uh, goggles or the helmet mounted display uh, no the i had's so the eye has is uh, fairly similar. Uh, there's a question a little further down the sheet yeah. about the symbol generator. That's new, that, or that's old. Or there's a new system for that. Uh, but but the concept is basically the same. Interesting, guys. Okay. Any uh, follow-up questions on this, guys, before we move on? Okay. Uh, the next question is, if you could improve... The patchy in any way what would you do yeah that's a that's a tough question that's one sexy machine <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh i would say uh, maybe cup holders <laughs> <laughs> creature comforts, it, creature it's, comforts. It's definitely it is it's not built or, uh, for the pilot to be comfortable it's, no it doesn't look good to do uh, to do a job mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, you couldn't ask for a more uh, reliable aircraft, I don't mm -hmm. think, uh, at least in my experience. More jump. I'm just going to... Okay. Very good, guys. Um, anything from you on that, Pal? In terms of kind of the maintenance side, would you like to see improvement? For instance, we get F-16 maintainers here, and they say it's impossible to work on because it's so tight. Anything based... Anything like that? Yeah, so again, going back to my earlier comment, um, given uh, where we are in our careers now, it's actually what we do for a living is we play, uh, it's my direct job is to help work to make the maintenance better. Um, it could always be better, um, but uh, we understand that there's trade trade off with the, when we work with the engineers and stuff. And so when you, it's when you get behind the curtain and you see, oh, they're not out to get me, they're doing their best. And so, no, I don't really have any poignant things to say other than, I know that the Boeing team and all them are working really hard to, uh, uh, to make a better product. Wow, wow, I'm just looking at the kind of guts of the aircraft. There's some weird stuff in there. Jeez, so, look at all that, so guys. One, Sorry, one, guys. Of things, uh, one of the things that we do is uh, when we find something wrong with the aircraft, we go after it. Uh, there's a, The Army has a program where they work with Boeing, and uh, it, it's... We had they have made they're constantly making improvements and they have made many improvements uh, uh, in the drivetrain in, in the rotor system in the maintenance procedures. Uh, so when we find something wrong with it, uh, it it's usually uh, pretty easy to get it fixed and taken care of. Oh, John. Okay, guys, very good. Uh, let's push on. Uh, question six. I heard the flechette rocket, sorry for the pronunciation, did not have to touch a target to kill it. Can someone explain what that type of rocket is and what the what they're talking about, please? So the flechettes, and uh, by all means, guys, we'd like to hear what you have to say, too. Uh, so flechettes are, uh, you got a great picture there on Google. Uh, um, does it have to hit the target? Uh, I think pretty much everything has to hit the target for it to be effective. I'm not sure what they what the intent of that question was. Um, they create, it, actually, it actually saturates a pretty large area when you fire it because of the quantity of flechettes that are in there. Hmm. And you can see the picture you're highlighting. There's, I forget how many, a thousand something. Uh, but yeah, it's like anything. It's a point target weapon, or it's a... Uh, you know, ballistic effects. So, what is Stalker? Talk us through what this warhead is. Do you know? I'm sorry, Cap. What'd you say? What? Talk us through this warhead, this, this flechette. I've never heard of it before. Well, flechette is uh, a fused warhead. It's called the uh, wall in space, or a hydra system. And it works the same way. 
and you have to set it to a range, and it's uh, full of thousands of these little little darts. Hmm. And uh, there is a die. There's a die inside the warhead, so it allows the pilot to adjust fire. You set it to a certain range, say, uh, I don't know, thousand meters or so. What it'll do is once it reaches that thousand meters, the uh, warhead will open up and those darts will be dispersed. Hmm. This is like anti infantry. Uh, missile. Yeah? It's the missile yeah. projected nail bomb. This reminds me of back in the, the day of cannon and cannonballs. You remember they would just put um, grape shot in. Yeah, yeah. canister nice. shot. They called it, didn't it? Yeah, ah, canister shot. Yeah, interesting. I didn't yeah, know. Was... Yeah, I didn't know there were such things. But okay, very nice. You have rounds yeah. nasty too. Yeah, you can get short. It's only effective if one of those flechettes hits whatever you're aiming mm. at. You, yeah. They, they uh, do flechette rounds on artillery ammunition as well, which work in a similar way. Oh, about that. Okay, guys, fair enough. Right. Uh, I don't think they're allowed anymore, to, to be honest with you. I was going to say, they seem, a, they seem a bit nasty. They seem a bit cluster bomby, don't they? A little bit nasty. But Yeah, they are. Uh, they're kind of grouped in the category with white phosphorus. Mm. Uh, they're not necessarily... Uh, not permitted. It, it's very much situational dependent. Watch out. Okay, guys. I've, killed, I've killed a couple of cows with them on <laughs> rain. <laughs> Only talking. The issue, it's the issue in part is, as with cluster bombs, it's the ones that don't explode as they should mm. that uh, get left lying around that then go off when someone is in the proximity. And, mm. and so it's the same issue as cluster bombs. Mm, okay. Right. Oh, well, let's push on after that cheery thought, guys. Um, how important are aircraft mechanics and which mechanic do you look up to? So that's to both of you, apparently. So, uh, my favorite mechanic's on the line. <laughs> oh, uh, we saw this. I, I, I didn't know how to answer this. Uh, um, but uh, but so there's this there's this two things we, we, we know or we say in the army anyways. And what you don't people realize or know behind the curtain is for when you watch these cool videos online mm -hmm. with the infantry killing something, there are up to 10 to 20 support people, cooks, uh, legal. Uh, so for every one soldier pulling a trigger, there's 10 to 20 support soldiers mm -hmm. right behind the scenes. The same thing goes for aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, for every hour Dustin flies, uh, my guys have to expend up to 20 uh, man hours on mm -hmm. average. So uh, what we'll do is we'll budget that into a year or into a time period. So uh, Dustin and, and, and the flight crew have to, f because of training and other requirements, uh, I'm just going to throw an easy number out of 100, 100 flight hours. Uh, that helps he and I plan our maintenance posture because we know it's going to be a times 20, uh, up to a times 20 uh, uh, threshold of the man hours that go in behind the scenes. So um, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. Um, you're getting kids off the street. Some of them aren't lifers, and but it, it's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, you learn a lot uh, uh, along the way. And then guys like Dustin, uh, he'll mentor the young guys. They look up to him, and that you know he'll take his experience and just like he's sharing here, he'll share with the young guys and try to help make a better mechanic. Roger, guys. Yeah, it's like um, when you go into an air show and you see. Um, well, you, you say the patchy, but I say like an F-16 or something. It goes up and does a, like a seven-minute display, and you think, oh, that was fun, very good, now let's go home. But what you don't realise is for that seven-minute display, you've got hours and hours of professional mechanics work going on in the background, and it's never even a consideration, is it? You never, never think it's something you even think about. Absolutely. And, and the funny part is you say that sometimes our leadership doesn't know that. So mm -hmm. sometimes our leadership will come to Dustin and I in meetings and be like, we want to we want to take 10 helicopters and go here and do X, Y and Z. And we kind of cringe like, yeah, no, I get it. That that makes sense. But you got to pay for that mm -hmm. in man hours, mm -hmm. parts and money. And so Dustin and I will normally work with the commander, um, what his requirement is, uh, because it's funny you say that sometimes the leadership doesn't realize oh there's a lot that goes behind this they just see dustin out there flying and killing stuff also and think it's cool and don't realize the cost uh, mm -hmm. and, and and time that goes into to get there yeah long story short they're very important um 
Yeah. And there's and, and they have to be highly skilled people, right? Uh, these aren't simple systems. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Right, very good, guys. Okay, let's move on. Uh, question number eight: Can you describe a proper helicopter landing circuit, and how is VRS uh, was a vortex ring state modeled in DCS? I can do how is VRS modeled in DCS, but you guys would have to do the. Can you describe a helo landing circuit? Yeah, so uh, it's the same. Uh, the uh, upwind, uh, crosswind, downwind leg uh, mm -hmm. base is uh it's described the same way it's just generally smaller and closer to the ground we don't go as high uh on that note though we don't really do traffic patterns <laughs> <laughs> you just straight in <laughs> yeah the uh you know a traffic pattern has a purpose uh, it's you know maybe slowing down or mm. separating two aircraft and we can in a helicopter we just do that different way we just slow down i was gonna say uh, yeah your your your, your f-15 can't slow down so it has to be in a pattern but you, you can stop if you have to yeah uh actually i was going into a, a an airport uh near atlanta uh, to call peach street and the controller we we're a flight of five uh and the controller's like hey i need you to make a 360 for spacing uh, this jet's gonna land first <laughs> and it was uh, it was like over the internal radio no no everyone's screaming don't make a 360 you got a flight of five behind you uh uh we just sort of ignored it we slow down to like 40 knots and just make the spacing we need to make mm. more job okay and i wondered if it was uh if there'd be anything like you get with uh, mixed powered and glider aircraft circuits where if you have your powered planes doing a left-hand uh, landing circuit, your gliders will do a right-hand landing circuit to keep them out of the way because they're slower. Yeah, definitely. Uh, our traffic patterns are a lot of times on the opposite side of the runway or sometimes, uh, in fact, a lot of times uh, you have special procedures like you approach from two uh, VFR points and you don't get you don't enter the pattern at all uh, helicopters are expected to come you know uh, on a 60 degree angle from you know creek or trees or whatever the waypoint is yeah i see this a lot because i fly or used to fly when we were allowed to uh, quite a lot around aberdeen airport and there uh, you've got a large number of north sea support helicopters flying in amongst the civilian airline traffic and there the patterns are opposite direction uh, to keep them apart hmm. interesting guys uh and quickly vrs because it's something i know at least a little bit about it's where you can i guess stall your own chopper in its own kind of wake turbulence isn't it guys uh probably a bad description there but you you stall the helicopter's blades in its own downwash and um and you can sink to a rather miserable death in dcs it's a massive thing it's, and it's as far as i know you know i'm not a helicopter pilot but it's, it's well modeled and it's something you're constantly on, on the lookout for looking for the signs looking at your vsi and whatnot is vrs a thing you have to worry about in, in a real apache because in some helicopters it's big some is small uh yeah for sure uh, so it, we commonly don't call it vortex ring state uh most of the time we discuss it as either mushing or settling and that's because we're on two different ends of the bucket speed uh, so if you're going really slow and you're coming to a, a hover out of ground effect we would call it settling with power, uh, which is really, it, it's a, a form of, vor of entering the vortex ring state. And then if you're going really fast in high speed flight and you, uh, you know, slip up uh, coming out of a, dim a diving maneuver, uh, you can likely mush through, we would, we would call it mushing, uh, similar things under different conditions. Roger. Hmm, well explained. I was, I was playing around a little bit with the helicopters in DCS. After you guys invited us to do mm. the interview, I figured I should mm. probably fly a couple <laughs> of the helicopters. <laughs> uh, and, and it seems like it's modeled, I think it's modeled accurately. It's hard to tell because mm -hmm. uh, flying in those states is all about feel. Ah, it's, that's uh, interesting. Uh, and you can't feel anything in a simulator or, or at least in a non-motion simulator. But that's like you said, you have to watch that DSI. Roger, yeah, man, at the risk of opening a, a can of worms, it's one thing I'm try. I try and get to the, the developers who, who are making these models is uh, it's essential because a real pilot often doesn't even fly by his cages; he does it all by his ass. 
right? Yeah, um, exactly. Fast jet, helicopter, airliner. Well, maybe not an airliner, but you know what I mean? It's all done by how he, you know, because that's his best sensory input. It tells him everything he needs to know. Obviously, we can never have that in DCS. So you've got to, as a developer of a virtual Apache or whatever, you've got to somehow find a way of emulating that by shaking the cockpit, by having a great sound engine, by whatever you know you got to do because you can't do it all by um, uh, gauges because a real pilot wouldn't because he's got other stuff to concentrate on. But so there's a, a, another well point made there. Um, anything else on that before we move on okay guys this is actually an interesting one number nine a pilot and a good and a maintainer good friends i mean um usually every time i speak to a maintainer they hate the pilots and vice versa well maybe not quite that much but you know what i mean there's 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 somewhat there's often i've got a bit of feuding going on should we say um all jokes aside how did you guys friendship develop coming from two different sides of military aviation work uh, Cap, I have a saying, and it is: uh, "There's only one thing worse than a pilot, and that's an Apache pilot." <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, my career obviously was in maintenance. So, I'm a ground guy. I, I worked on the helicopter as a mechanic, and then went to Warren Officer Canada School and became a Chief Warren Officer, like Dustin, as a maintenance manager. Uh, so, still staying on that side. Uh, Dustin's track was a little different, where he was maintenance on the ground side, then he went Warren Officer. His first few years, and he'll speak to it. Uh, his first few years is just learn how to be a pilot. That, your only job in the world is learn how to fly the helicopter as a professional. Uh, and at some point in your career, three, four to five years down the road, you have to pick what's called a track. Do you want to be an instructor pilot, a tactical pilot, uh, a safety pilot, or a maintenance pilot? Well, it's a rare breed to be a maintenance pilot because you're pretty much signing up. You're going from the cool days of coming in, flying, and going home to 12-hour days in the trenches with me working on the helicopters. But guys like him love it. They can't get away from it. It's a, it's a love-hate relationship. So he came to my organization as a junior, uh, as a newly minted test pilot. So he had experience flying, but he was inexperienced with the Apache maintenance, and so he was learning uh, we, uh, we, we, he actually came to the unit right before we went to Afghanistan. So I met him. He was eager to learn. I was managing at the time, the battalion maintenance program overall. And so he was an integral part of that. And he was, a, a, one of the younger pilots, uh, but he was eager to learn. And he, we both just had this shared passion for getting it right and wanting to know how to do things better. And, um, so not to say I took him under my wing, but we kind of gravitated towards each other because he noticed that I had a passion for it. And I noticed that he had a passion for it. And so I'm going to invested him. So our relationship started out professional, me kind of explaining to him, you know, you got the book answer when you're in the schoolhouse. Now let me show you the kind of the nuances out here. And then that just blossomed into a friendship. We'd play poker with the Aussies every Saturday night. And then uh, he was a motorcycle rider. Uh, so he taught me how to ride. I came home and bought a Harley. Every, after every deployment, you got to get a new hobby, spend some money. So I went out and bought a Harley and he ta he's taught me how to ride that. And we ride together. And, and then ever since then, we just uh, our, our, our paths have always crossed probably by design a little bit. And now we we literally live 20 minutes apart mm -hmm. and we work in a building 30 meters apart on some of the same projects daily. So sometimes we yell at each other. Sometimes we drink whiskey and have fun. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's that unique, but maybe, maybe it's a little unique. Awesome. Anything from Dustin? Play poker, play so, poker with the Aussies. You, now you know these guys are brave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we spent our first Christmas together doing a pedostatic test, and that's when I knew it was uh, going to be a lot. Oh, God. <laughs> Remember the first sight. <laughs> so those tubes on the aircraft, you know, that mm -hmm. detect airspeed? Well, we have to put a test set up to it, and it literally takes four hours to complete mm -hmm. the test. And, and uh, we had some disagreements about how the test should go and, and what the manual it was right or wrong. So he came to me Christmas morning. It was a slow day, and he's like, come on, we're going to go do this. And I was like, yeah, come on, we're going to go do this. So he took me to the hangar, and he had it all set up, and we spent Christmas Day reviewing <laughs> the test and, and trying to get it better which most people would fucking mm -hmm. jam their eyes out with boredom but that's just the stuff he and i enjoyed doing mm -hmm. I, I knew i was it was almost a, a joke hey let's go do this pure static check because everyone else is going to eat you mm -hmm. know a, a great meal in the chow hall and he's like okay let's go and i was like oh all right this guy we're serious <laughs> <laughs> very good boys very good okay very good. Um, the next question we've got here, you'll have to explain what a rotor br break is because I don't know, but during a rotor break start, how is it the engines are idle, spinning, but the main rotor and tail is not spinning? Do you want that one, Chuck, or you want? Uh, uh, you can have it. So um, it's a 
fluid dynamics thing, right? Uh, a turbine engine has uh, it's it's complicated. <laughs> uh, but there's a power turbine section, and there's a section called a, a gas generator usually, and there's probably a little bit of vocabulary challenges, especially between the UK and the US. Uh, usually, we refer to them as NG and NP. Uh, they're they're not physically connected. They're connected by fluid dynamics. So the NG section creates a uh, certain uh, pressure from from ambient air. You're pulling ambient air through a compressor, and that extremely high pressure causes the turbine section to turn like a fan. Uh, and so there there's no physical connection from the component that's driving the rotor system to the component that's creating this uh, air pressure. Uh, so engines are turbine engines are complicated. This is like a you know a six semester hour class that you get mm. in flight school. Mm. Uh, but the long story short is they're not physically connected. Right. They're, so they're, they're is connected it, by air pressure. Is it like a torque converter in a car? So I was thinking it, fluid. Yeah. So it's it's almost exactly like a uh, a torque motor or a, obviously one difference is that it's using hydraulic mm. fluid mm. versus we're we're using air pressure mm -hmm. how interesting and so that means and presumably back to the idea of the question that means that you can basically uh, i know they're not linked per se but you can purposefully make it so that that air pressure is not getting through to the thing that drives the rotors you can bleed it off so or whatever uh it's it's not the, so one important point is that they the engines are at idle so the pressure is mm. therefore low enough that it can pass through the blades uh, mm. the, the the power turbine blades. Once you once you start advancing the engine, obviously the pressures are going to become mm. overwhelming, and and the the rotor brake would fail. Hmm. Right. Or the something's going to fail. Right. I get it, guys. How interesting. I wonder if that's the same in any of our helicopters we've got in DCS. I've never thought about it. I've always assumed it's like a car, a gearbox, clutch, blah blah blah. But I've never. So Gazelle has it. Hmm. Uh, it, it's uh, it would yeah, it would be very much aircraft specific and engine specific as mm -hmm. to whether or not the gas generator section of the engine can turn uh, at idle without the power turbine section turning. Mm. Uh, is there enough relief there? And I think most helicopters probably can. I mean, I can't. You know, I'm, I've flown three helicopters. Uh, but I think it, turbine engines, it's by design that they can run at idle uh, without yeah, the power you. turbine turning. Well, Roger, guys. Mm, yep, uh, it does make sense. I can't really I find any obvious pictures, but I, at least I understand what you're talking about. Okay, anything anyone wants to, anyone wants to add to that? If you, uh, if you tried power turbine, maybe. Uh, Cap, if you look in that top left picture you're looking at, that was right. actually the rotor brake. It's actually a caliper. Uh, it's oh, just like a that. car. Yeah. yeah, so it you're basically holding the transmission mm. against its wheel mm -hmm. uh, while the engine is at idle. Mm. I got it. Right. How interesting. Okay. Yep. I'll, send you a, uh, I'll send you a picture that you could post later. Uh, I Roger. would have sent it to you already, but I'm behind the power curve. It's, it's a cutaway of an engine. Uh, that that we have here at Fort Rucker mm -hmm. that we use for training, and you can see how complex the passageways are inside a turbine engine. It's it's pretty incredible. Right, I'm gonna make a note of that engine pick. Right, very good guys. Let's push on. This one's from our very own Stalker, and as you probably know, he, he flies about just every chopper that's ever invented. 64 AH1 Pui, God knows what. Um, what message do you get if the symbol generator fails? It doesn't mean anything to me. What's what's that all about? I guess it goes back to the uh, question about the helmet mounted display. Uh, a symbol generator actually was an A64 Alpha model thing. Uh, it's been replaced by technology, but uh, the, the same thing Ouch. is there. <laughs> well, it wasn't previously. Yeah, the uh, the same function is is still there. You're getting that symbology in your helmet mounted display and uh it, when it fails you're in real trouble right uh, uh it, especially if you're close to the trees it, it can be a, a a high pucker factor even mm -hmm. do you want to explain stalker it's supposed to be an in-joke but the in-joke is 
if you get certain systems failures, you'll get a message in your symbology. But if your symbol generator fails, you don't get any indication because all your symbology just goes away. Ah, cunning. In the fail messages, you don't have anything to look at. (laughs) (laughs) Very good, boys. Very good. Okay, then. That's just a trick, fuck. I get it. I get it. Let's push on, guys. Uh, Right, where are we? For a time, the army toyed with mounting stingers and sidewinders on the outer edge of the wings. What's your thought on this? Uh, Something they should have stuck with or just no point? So, obviously, this is could be a sensitive subject um, mm. the army when the army makes a decision like that they're going through a a uh, very expensive study most of the time on a classified range uh, determining you know is the cost worth the benefit um, my opinion basically doesn't matter <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh, there's a reason we don't carry them anymore uh, however I can tell you the army's bottom left cap interested in uh in looking at it again we're always evolving and and keeping current on what's going on with threats and missile systems roger didn't the cobra have sidewinders or something how come the cobra got it and the apache didn't did anyone know that so it wasn't that it didn't get it actually uh the hard mounts are still there today Uh, physically you could install it Uh, it's just a more of a techniques thing do we need it at this time roger it wasn't in the mission description or whatever. If you go back in your browser cap and then mm-hmm. back one more, it's down. The, it was in the bottom of the, the images that you brought up. I don't know. You might have to go back to Roger. Yeah, there, there. You're right on it. You just went past it. Look at it. The side one is on the side of the. Oh, look at that. Stop wing. Look at that. It looks a bit weird, but there you go, guys. That is an Apache with sidewinders. Well, it was before I got rid of it. And that is the one. That and that's the, obviously the. Cobra, I think. Uh, all right, guys. Well, yeah, that's the answer. Very good, guys. Uh, let's push on. What is the worst slash craziest experience you've ever had in both the 64 and the 58? Uh, so, I would I would go back to uh, the VRS question. <laughs> mm. uh, so, <clears throat> sort of makes me emotional a little bit. I almost killed a guy uh, settling uh, while it was mushing through at about 140 knots. It's kind of hard to talk about. Mm, absolutely. Uh, I got target fixated. And uh, we recovered at like, <laughs> I don't know, seven feet, mm. nine feet. It was single digits on the radar altimeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, just got lucky. Roger. How, out of interest, then, how do you mush at such high speeds? Because I thought the idea was you could only do it at slow speeds, but I guess I got that wrong. No, so that's what I was saying earlier. Uh, vortex range state can come on, can onset in two very different ways. One is very slow, like you said, uh, and the other one is if you're at high, in high speed flight, hmm. the rotor is still making vortices. Uh, it always, if it's turning, it's making vortices. And uh, so if you you can put it aerodynamically in a situation where you're going, you know, at high speed, 140, 120 knots, and the rotor is tilted such that it's still pulling its vortices into itself. Uh, and, and we call it, usually call that mushing. How interesting. Uh, it's hmm. it's a pretty serious condition. Uh, and, and actually it's killed a few people, a lot of people probably. Watch out. Okay, lost your stuff, indeed. Okay, very good answer. Um, Okay, guys, Uh, is it true the Apache helicopter, this is for Pale, is it true the Apache helicopters don't start all the time for unknown reasons? (laughs) Anytime it doesn't start, it's an unknown reason, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So, no, I wouldn't say all the time. Uh, The Apache has uh, somewhat of a bad rep as a maintenance problem, and there's a a reason for that. Um, If you look at the history of aviation, we kind of started off with the Huey and the Cobra as our primary weapons, Mm -hmm. and they're very uh, rudimentary. Now, the the very newest Huey today and and Cobra are not, but the old ones were very rudimentary. When the Army jumped to the Black Hawk and the Apache, it was a big technological jump. As as Dustin said, the gun falls as head. 
Um, well, with the Blackhawk, it was still a, just a really nice Huey. It didn't have anything special. It was still steam gauges, and its mission was to pick up troops and drop troops off. So start, as long as the engine started and the system came online, you could fly that aircraft. Well, we got kind of a bad rap in the 80s because we have – multiple computers mounted to this this aircraft where when he turns his head the gun follows and just like playing with dcs if you ever you know when we get online together with dcs inevitably somebody has a problem with eye tracker or their mm-hmm. hotas it's no different with the helicopter the more things you add to it the more uh, potential for a failure and so we have a lot more to maintain we we the the inverse of that is we've learned a lot from it and we're probably a stronger community on the maintenance side within the apache community because we've had those hard knocks but you're mounting 30 some computers to a, a leaky shaky mm-hmm. dirty helicopter and and you're going to have failure so it's to to the root of the question the engines are the same ones as the blackhawks uh they're pretty and i'll let mr case us to speak to a little bit they're probably one of the stronger points of that aircraft that engine is really strong um our, our i wouldn't say weakness but our vulnerabilities in a system again is all the computers and all the things we add to it and we're continuing to add things to it to take uh to take the load off the pilot as you will uh for everything you add that means there's a failure point and so that's always you know a, a challenge to uh to keep keep up and running and, and and keep it working smoothly so dustin can go out and do his job very good anything yeah, from just, you? yeah sorry just to plug that ge engine i don't work for ge but uh i've had exactly one engine problem uh in my helicopter experience in in 3,000 hours and there's two engines on there so that's 6,000 engine hours Mm. Uh, and even that one wasn't necessarily serious it didn't quit on me Uh, uh, so it's it's I'm not sure where that question came from Uh, the engines are very reliable Roger yeah everyone seems to like GE engines the F-16 maintainers have had an all lovely GE engine say they're bulletproof for some reason but Okay. Can I ask a question? Send, Stalker. Uh, I flew the 701 Charlie engines. What what uh, what engines are you guys flying now? And uh, have you guys got the DECU issues? I'm sure you got it under control now. Yeah, we're flying uh, 701 Deltas, which is a... So there's actually a couple of variants between the Charlie and the Delta, believe it or not. There's a Charlie Charlie and a Delta Charlie and a Delta and a Delta, I, I get them all mixed up. I'm the army. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're all reliable. Uh, and the, the newest one is even more powerful than, than the Charlie model was. Awesome. Okay, guys. Um, right, let's punch on, shall we? Uh, how would you rate film... How would you rate the film Firebirds? I've never seen that. On how it shows US... Army helicopter operations. I know it was supposed to be an Army air assault version of Top Gun for the US Navy fighter pilots, but I am curious how it stacks up in your opinion. Note, I enjoyed both films. I've never seen it. Maybe I'll have to see it. We'll see. Yeah, you have to see it. Okay. Cap, we know it. we just stop this interview right now so you can go watch it. It's the greatest movie ever <laughs> hey, made. Guys, it's not me. You got to get it past Allison. That's that's <laughs> her. You got to say it, it to her. It's a, it's a really bad Top Gun, but I always oh, tell baby people it's my it's, baby. It's about our helicopter. So screw it's you. It's a helicopter Ryan Eagle. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, that's that's a good analogy. It's an. It, but we loved it. a lot of our people in our community like to make fun of it. And I'm like, mm. screw you. That is our Top Gun. Nah. We're, that's our baby. It's ugly, but we're gonna love it. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll caveat to that. Um, we, there's a current movie out about an organization I went to combat with. I'm not in it. I was interviewed for it on some background stuff, but I'm not in it. But there's a documentary called uh, Apache Warrior, mm-hmm. and it documented uh, my organization's uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003. So it's a really good film. Uh, it was produced by one of our mechanics who got out of the Army and went to Hollywood to do commercials and stuff. And so just a little plug uh uh, Apache Warriors is a really good, honest documentary about the capability of that helicopter and, and what it can withstand. Roger, uh, it's that. How do we get hold of that? Because I know it's on Netflix it's on in the Netflix. UK. Yeah, and there's a there's a number of trailers for it on YouTube. If you just do Apache Warrior Roger, film, I've got Netflix, so Alison's going to have to suck it up. I think. Right, very good, guys. Um, anything on that before we move on, guys? You need to go watch. Uh, 
Apparently I do. Apparently I do. Right, okay, I'll start selling the idea. Okay, guys, let's move on to number 16. For the pilots, can the longbow radar detect people or is it only for vehicles? Now, let me get this right. Is this the radar that's on, mounted on top of the rotor stack? Yeah, so uh, just like the F-16 has a fire control radar, the Apache longbow has a fire control radar. Uh, it's, it's mounted up above the rotor system to sort of keep the radar mm -hmm. out of the uh, obviously the rotor blades would be a problem passing mm -hmm. through the, the radar field um, it, it uh, is designed to pick up vehicles it's not really uh, you're not going to have any luck trying to find people with it, mm. is, it is it detect air threats as well or is it purely a ground search type radar yeah it can pick up uh, air targets I'd love to it's see inside not, uh, it doesn't have the same can kind of range that an f-16 has yeah uh, but it, it can it's it's a basic radar you know um, mm. it's blasting out energy and receiving a return and it can see see what uh what what's out there you can actually terrain follow with it as well roger i you see can, um, it's process a lot of targets at the same time yeah and when i say terrain follow you're not we're not talking like uh you know a cruise missile terrain following mm, we're talking mm. it can show you a hazard in front of you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i see so inside we've got a box of electronics we've got a funny little antenna and um mm, very interesting I'm, su I'm surprised that's on the internet why really? i was just always in the impression that was classified yeah i believe it is you actually won't believe every every you know, professionals that we have on. Internet doesn't mean it's not pro not. <laughs> no, I, right. this will be unclassified. You can tell. You can tell that that's a proper, you know, professional picture. But I have so many people come on and say, "Oh, sorry, I can't talk about that. Sorry, I can't talk about that." And for perfectly normal things like this, you wouldn't think. And then you just type right. a Google, and it's all there. And like, <laughs> it's all there. It's like it's nothing secret anymore. I swear. It all comes out of China or God knows where. But anyway, yeah. So that's interesting. Very good. Um, I'm trying to think of some clever questions. Anyone got any clever questions about how that uh, that you can talk about on the radar? Oh, I was just <laughs> going to say it, it. It can process a lot of targets at the same time, can't so it? So, like, 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 like TWS in a F-16, where you can get target A, B, C, D, and whatnot. Yeah, um, and honestly, I can't remember. Uh, and I, not, that's, I'm not trying to fake a sensitive mm. subject. I I can't remember how many targets you can process. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's very similar. It, it's a it's a basic radar. You know, all radars are basically mm. Mm. radars. Like they they all have the same technology. Mm. Mm. And as I remember, uh, the, the 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 longbow radar has the nice feature that you can pop up, take a snapshot uh, mm. with the radar, and then basically switch it off again. Uh, and then you can uh, use that snapshot to sort of do an initial guidance on radar guided missiles, things like that. So you're not exposing yourself all the time. Then you just pop up again uh, towards the terminal time to actually do the final guidance. Yeah, it also uh, has the obvious advantage of being on top of the aircraft. So you can mm -hmm. hide behind, you know, trees mm -hmm. or clutter and sort of expose only the radar. Mm -hmm. so, and I'd, I'll share something with the caveat that if it's uh, sensitive or classified, uh, Dustin will let us know and we can omit it from this. Uh, mm -hmm. But so not every... Longbow has that radar. Uh, we actually only put one or two per company or one or two per eight aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so that radar gathers the targets and then shares it with the other aircraft. So it's kind of a, a force multiplier in that aspect that uh, the entire fleet doesn't have the radar, but only select ones carry the, carry it for the mission mm -hmm. uh, and then share it. Is that is that a correct sentiment, uh, Dustin? Yeah, yeah. We don't – there's not fielded one-to-one. -one. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a data it's link there. Yeah, date must be a data link, wasn't it? Believe it or not, the old Jane, uh, Jane's AH-64 Apache simulator from probably about, what, eight, nine years ago used to model all of these things. So it had, mm. you know, the data link, uh, it had mm. the snapshot radar targeting, all this sort of stuff going on. It, it was great fun. Mm. Interesting, guys. So does that mean the ones that have not got the radar, does that mean they've got a, the dome up there but it's empty or no dome? No, they just won't have anything. You, we call them flat tops. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, guys, very good. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, let's move on. How long is the cold and dark start in the patch? I don't know what cold and dark start means. I guess that literally means it's completely off in every way. How long is that, guys? Yeah, so uh, to start it from nothing with the battery off, uh, 
probably 15 minutes, I guess. Uh, it just depends on the situation because mm. I've been in situations where you skip a lot of checks. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, just a, you, know, you accept certain risks. Time is always about mm. risk. Uh, it, I have also spent you know, over an hour just before I even started the engines, just preparing the cockpit and preparing the systems and preparing the, you know, wh whatever we're going to go do. So it's very situational. Mm. In uh, DCS, you're supposed to do all these professional checks for the planes for the startup. No one ever does it. You literally turn the engine on, turn your heart on, and hope for the best. <laughs> and sometimes, right. sometimes it bites you in the ass, and sometimes it doesn't. But, and um, sometimes that's the real deal too. Uh, mm. I have been on missions where we're going to to try to recover a, a wounded American, mm. and you just skip the checks and you go, and it mm. takes about uh, probably three minutes to crank in an Apache. Mm. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, what was your reaction first seeing the Apache? Um, this is for both of you. So let me know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, so I joined the Army in 1993. And uh, like I said, I sat down and I loved aviation. They're like, here, be a Apache guy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. That's pretty cool. And I, I will tell you, when I saw the question, I, again, I can remember to this day, it, it's a hangar in Fort Eustis, Virginia, is where we teach our mechanics. And it just had a certain glow in that hangar, or maybe it's just my memory. But it was, it was like something out of the movies. It was like that scene where you're just like, oh, my God, that's the most awesome thing you've ever seen. Uh, and the funny thing to that is uh, through my career and having gone back and uh, through Fort Eustace, Virginia for various schools and, and, be, and doing what I do, those are those are just trainer aircraft it's not a real aircraft mm -hmm. in some case they're crash damaged mm -hmm. uh and they've been worked on a lot so they're really in bad shape so later on in your career when you look at that same aircraft you kind of laugh because it's the it's the bad one of the group but at the time it was the coolest thing i'd ever saw uh and uh it was just like in the movies i got something to say about eustace send the uh the hulk that they used for the crash the patchy in the movie Thunderbirds was there when I was there. Oh, nice, yeah. Firebird. Firebird. <laughs> near, enough, near enough. Okay, um, anything from Dustin on that? Uh, my, the first time I saw it was, I think I was probably 15. I wasn't driving yet, and I saw it at a uh, air show at Fort Jackson, and that's probably what created the passion that it took to get there. Uh, the guy fired the uh, aircraft up and he started moving the gun around. Of course, it's a you know it's a dis display. The gun was empty, but the whole crowd just screamed and mm -hmm. ran like children. Mm -hmm. and I was like, "Yep, I'm gonna fly that thing." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a transformer or something. Very good, guys. Okay, uh, right. So next is for Dustin. How was the transition between the Kiowa, even though? Kiowa, it's not that or something. Uh, the 50H, we say, and the Apache. Yeah, so um, generally we're more talking about a Kiowa or Kiowa. Uh, it's the Delta Model 58, the one that uh, you guys are building, mm. I think, recently. Mm. Uh, or Eagle Dynamics is building mm. recently. The Alpha Model uh, was is a stripped-down variant. It's it's a, it's basically... It's, far more closer resembles a TH-67 than it does a OH-58 Delta. Uh, so the transition was, it, it, they're entirely different aircraft. Uh, it doesn't even have a flight management computer. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's a training helicopter. So mm -hmm. uh, very complex. I think at the time it, it was a 12 or 15 weeks uh, transition course. Just it, you already know how to fly a helicopter. We're just teaching you how to fly an Apache. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an additional twelve weeks or whatever. Roger, Roger. Any uh, notable moments from that or anything? Uh, well, so actually, watch the movie Firebirds. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, the the uh, HDU and trying to fly at night under a night vision system NVS or with the iHeads is notable uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people talk about it uh a lot of people make make fun of uh nicholas cage for wearing panties on his head mm -hmm. uh, that that is difficult it's emotionally difficult a lot of people struggle with it but uh if you fight it out you can you you just get through it, it it's a matter of practice 
My job. Okay. Cap, if Nicolas Cage wearing panties on his head is not enough for you to go watch the movie, yeah, I don't absolutely. Know I is. can't think of much better if I'm honest, but that sounds that sounds ideal, guys. Right. Okay. Uh, next one is to Pale. You are apparently a grease monkey now. How was it getting your hands dirty under the panels, electronics, and mechanical components under the Apache? I don't know if he's trying to compare that against something else or just generally. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah. So I read that. I mean. Uh, so generally we try to keep the aircraft very clean uh it is a it is a fight to do that uh they get very dirty uh like i said they leak hydraulic fluid mm-hmm. so it's um it's kind of like tar and feather once the hydraulic fluid is leaked then it, it all the dirt sticks to it mm-hmm. so it's 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 a constant battle um we try to use pressure washers but you have to be careful with the pressure washer or you can actually damage the mm-hmm. aircraft uh when i joined the army in 93 and and striker uh, I think it's strike stalker can speak to it. We literally do it with a brush and a bucket of water and we mm-hmm. just go out there. And, uh, so it's always a challenge. Um, uh, it's just, you know, it's part of the job and, and, uh, you, you do what you need to do and you, what you do is make ranks. So you don't have to do that anymore. And the junior guy does it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's only one thing worse than an aircraft leaking hydraulic fluid. What's that? When it stops leaking hydraulic. <laughs> when you've run out of hydraulic <laughs> fluid, you mean? Uh, I mean, this sounds like a weird question, but is it designed to leak, like, for instance, SR-71, or is it is it faulty? In some cases, that's great. That's a great point. Now, I was I, I was always fascinated when I learned that the SR-71 was designed to leak. There are certain components. Uh, two, two sides of that answer is some of our hydraulic components are designed to leak when static or no pressure mm-hmm. uh, because when just like with the sr-71 when pressure is applied then they seal up so mm-hmm. they have an allowable amount of leak mm-hmm. uh, and then some are supposed to not leak but when they do they have up to a certain amount and so mm-hmm. i will tell you that's probably 10 percent of me and dustin's job is going out there and looking at a leak and trying to determine whether it's safe for that pilot to take the aircraft mm-hmm. or do we need to pull that aircraft down and do heavy maintenance or light maintenance to get it back in the fight and so it, it it's a constant juggle to, to understand that. But yes, absolutely. The, the analogy of the SR-71 is actually a pretty good analogy for uh, uh, the components mm-hmm. that leak. Um, and the follow-up to that, you mentioned that you have to constantly look at these helicopters and determine with your eye whether you think they're um, safe to fly or not. Now, does that decision-making come purely from experience or is there a book that tells you, yes, it can fly, no, it can't fly? Absolutely. There's a, a book and, and uh, one of the challenges is uh, the different aircraft are made by different manufacturers. So they'll have different measurements. Mm. And sometimes within the same aircraft, it'll be different measurements. And what I've learned later on is one engineer thought it'd be great to measure hydraulic fluid by ounces mm. or uh, by leakage rate. Right. So in, in one instance, Mr. Uh, Dustin will go out and run the aircraft up and I would actually go into where the hydraulic servos are and he would stroke it 25 times back and forth. And then I would literally count how many droplets came mm. out. Mm-hmm. and that would determine serviceability and and really at the end of the day it's a very basic uh, easy way to determine it uh conversely on one of our gearboxes it's measured by weight and and but they don't tell you how to do it and mm-hmm. so what we kind of <laughs> learned was is you you go out uh, if you know anything about tear weight is you'll put your uh shop cloth on the scale to make sure whatever it weighs whatever mm-hmm. gram and then you tear weight that to zero and then you wipe up all the grease mm-hmm. you weigh it again and go did we hit the threshold for uh did we hit the threshold uh so 90 percent of it is book and then 10 percent of it is mr case and i look looking at it and trying to make the best determination based off uh, the, the technical manual, which was written by an engineer. And mm-hmm. then literally uh, what we say is translated to a dumb guy like myself who barely mm-hmm. graduated high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I would say was frequency, the hydraulics uh, frequently uh, leak. So we know that's something we just intuitively mm-hmm. know how to check. And then there may be something that leaks very rarely. And so we kind of got to get in the book mm-hmm. and kind of uh, kind of get together and go, hey, what do you think? What do you think? Well, let's try this and trial and error to to test the what the technical manual tells you to do. Mm-hmm. These things sound like my car constantly leaking, constantly breaking down. <laughs> it's it, it's really no different. It, it really that's a great analogy, uh, Mr. Dustin. He came from the ground side of maintenance, and that's why he was attracted to to the air side. And although we have a few. Um, maybe special things. It's no different. Uh, he owns a backhoe, and he has a hydraulic leak right now in the backhoe that we're working on. It's mm-hmm. it's funny. It's no different than when we work on an Apache. It's it's uh, for the motor. <laughs> yeah, got to get the parts in, and so yeah. it's 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 basic aircraft maintenance is, is basic maintenance of of the principles of, of uh, again keeping stuff clean and, and and the right procedures. Roger, it's good to have advert as well for any youngsters out there. If you got your first car and you're getting your hands dirty doing your first 
head gasket change or whatever, then you could always put those skills towards a, a Eurofighter or a Lynx or whatever, you know, in England. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Okay, guys, let's punch on. Um, we've already talked about this, but see if there's anything to add. How long did it take to train that eye for eye hands, and how did you go about training it? Yeah, so related to the transition question, mm. about transitioning from the OH to the Apache, uh, it, it's uh, what what they do at, at Army Flight School here is they'll put you in the aircraft and get you comfortable in the daytime, obviously, uh, and you're flying. In the daytime, you're always flying that symbology in your eye. Uh, and then the next transition, it doesn't go necessarily go to night. What they do is they close the cockpit in for the student pilot uh, with something called the bag, it's just called the bag, right? It, it's just a canopy blocker, so you can't see out the windows. And they leave the instructor pilot where they can see, and the student pilot is totally blind except for that that HDU mm. uh, on their helmet. And uh, you, you force, you just basically force the student to learn <laughs> learn to fly a, a HDU. Uh, and the, the IP is constantly recovering and correcting the aircraft until the student just finally powers through it. Uh, it's, it's not pleasant at all. Uh, a lot of guys come out and they're, you know, you're, you're drenched with sweat from your armpit to your wrist. Uh, some guy, <laughs> I saw a guy, they'll open the door when he comes in to refuel and they do a student change. The second student's getting ready to get in the aircraft and the student will be turned like uh, uh, with their head tilted you know, on a sixty-degree angle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because they're they're completely oblivious to the real world. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Uh, they're transit. It's it's virtual reality mm. more or less, except you're doing it in in an aircraft that's already moving. <laughs> mm-hmm. Very good. Okay. Um, next question: What were the biggest differences between the Delta and the Echo Apache, and that you felt were most demanding to both? That so that's maintenance and that's for. Um, piloting, and I must admit, I don't know anything about the difference between the D and the E. Uh, a couple of basic differences. It, it's a little more powerful. They improve the drivetrain. Uh, uh, the big difference for pilots probably is uh, the avionics package. Uh, uh, H64Ds were never really meant to fly under instrument conditions. It has the capability, it can fly under instrument conditions, but the Army made a deliberate decision with the H-64E, we're going to make this thing uh, a better instrument platform. So when you do the transition, you have to sort of brush up on your instrument flight training. Uh, And it's also got a few more capabilities as far as uh, teaming with unmanned aircraft. Uh, They're they're neat gadgets, uh, technologies, uh, but they're basically the same helicopter. on the pilot side, I think there's more difference in maintenance, probably. Pale. Yeah, so um, it's funny on the outside, I still can't tell the difference. Uh, Dustin can, he's, he's been doing it longer than I, I retired in a couple of years back, so I, I can't tell the difference on the outside, but it is truly one of those under the skin things. Um, we had some differences in, in drivetrain and some other items, uh, but the difference to me, uh, and I, I was during the transition of an A model to D model uh, and then the D to the E, uh, but one of the differences that we are and challenges we face on the ground side or the maintenance side is, uh, experience. Uh, when I came in and I was working on the A model, I had senior guys who'd been working on it for 15 years. So they could help teach me and they had the experience and they've learned the lessons. Well, when you would issue a, a, an entire unit to, to me and Dustin, a brand new aircraft, we have the same level of experience with that system as a private. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're expected to be the senior guys. And, and uh, Dustin, for example, was a technical inspector. So he would he had the authority to sign off work. So anything done on the helicopter takes a check and a balance. The maintainer does the work and then you have to have a technical inspector sign it off. So myself and Mr. Case would be placed in situations where we're supposed to sign something off. I haven't been a TI in years, but more recently, Mr. Case, uh, Dustin was a TI. He would be required to sign something off that he may not have a lot of experience with. So he'd have to, we'd have to do a little bit more homework and maybe phone a friend before you sign that off or you approach that maintenance task because you, you just don't have the, it's new and you don't have the experience. Watch out. Very good. Okay, um, to Dustin, so we've talked about the, the mushing, we've talked about the IP, so what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in flight training? Yeah, so we, we covered a 
couple of challenges like the IHADS thing. Uh, I, I think uh, the biggest challenge to flight training for maybe anyone is just getting started doing it. The, the whole It's going to be difficult. Uh, you have to commit to it. Uh, there's a lot of academics. There's a lot of physical requirements. Uh, it, you're going to lose some family time uh, temporarily while you're studying. Uh, it, it's it's a commitment uh, overall. It's uh, probably the biggest commitment I've ever made. Uh, it's it's not. There's nothing necessarily specifically difficult about it. it it's the overall challenge, I think. Roger, okay. Uh, talking about getting the AH-64 in DCS, do you think uh, the required technical classified information could currently be released to a game developer so that an accurate simulation of AX-64, specifically the D model, could be brought to DCS? Failing that, perhaps the A model. So what I think he's trying to say is, do you think the helicopter is too classified system-wise uh, or not for us to model it in DCS? Uh, just my opinion uh, is you probably have a bigger challenge with Boeing than you do with the Army. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not going to come off of their uh, flight management computer software. Right? They're not just going to mm. let you have that data. But I think it's worth a try. Um, and maybe the A model would be a, it would be easier to approach that because it's you know sort of obsolete in the real world. Mm. Uh, but I don't you know. It's a little bit out of my lane. I don't know what, that kind of, what kind of an agreement you would have to seek out. It's weird because, um, I mean, I was massively surprised to hear that they're developing the um, the Typhoon Eurofighter, which is a relatively new frontline fighter, um, and uh, a German ex-pilot who's just retired is is managed to get his hands on the the information for it. I find, I find it quite amazing, to be honest, a uh, plane that's in service. And again, same thing with the D model of the AH-64, I suppose. I'm amazed that anyone can get hold of the hold of that stuff. But anyway, uh, let's carry on. What are the noise levels in the cockpit, and is it something that bothers you in a mission? Uh, they're high. They're really high. Uh, we mm. use double hearing protection, uh, mm. so you have a an earplug that you stick in your ear that that has a built-in speaker. They're called uh, CEPs, I think, or or something like that. And then you wear a helmet over top of that, and the ear cup seals, so it's it's a double hearing protection because it's loud and you need it <laughs> Roger it's interesting um, is it like just rotor sound or I suppose it's everything engine sound yeah, vibration uh, it, all of the above yeah the uh, the air going past the canopies creates a lot of noise that mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect uh, but the rotors the engines the engines are screaming mm -hmm. uh, they're terribly loud uh, sometimes we do checks on the ground and I would have to leave the door open uh, for whatever reason, and it, that's uh, another form of hearing. Really, triple hearing protection when mm. you're inside the can mm. the cockpits with the canopies closed. Mm. Uh, that helps reduce some of the noise, also. But they're loud, yeah. Mm -hmm. job. Okay. Uh, how are the high terrain operations and heating heat affecting the performance of the Apache? So, for instance, the H model of the Huey we've got, we really struggle up mountains or even tall hills, because she just does not want to fly. Uh, is that a, a thing with Apache, or does she just power through? It's uh, part of the reason behind the Echo model and the Army's transition. Uh, our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, the, del the Delta's not underpowered, but it could have been better, and we made it better. Uh, so we can pretty much get anywhere that we need to be uh, reasonably. Uh, but it does. It obviously has an effect. I mean, density, altitude, and it has an effect on every aircraft. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Are the main rotor blades bullet resistant, and can they wear out in time? So uh, during the invasion of Iraq in 2003, we took quite a bit of battle damage. Uh, I had been in the army almost 10, 15 years at the time, but with no combat experience. Uh, so it was interesting when we went, we went to Afghanistan and Iraq to learn what this aircraft could actually do. Uh, it's funny, Cap, in, in the, in, back home here at Fort Rucker, uh, we measure damage to the thousands of an inch. So there are times where the blade may take in a certain area damage to seven thousands of an inch mm -hmm. and 
Dustin has to say, yep, we got to replace that guys. And we all agree. And it's a, it's a costly repair, mm-hmm. uh, in, I, in combat though, conversely, you mm-hmm. have to, as he said earlier, take risk. And so we didn't have enough blades. So I'm literally standing underneath an aircraft and I can see the sky. I can see a hole in it. Now, mm-hmm. uh, if you know anything about ballistics, whatever the size of the bullet is, it normally produces a smaller damage hole than like a seven, six, two, but it's still a hole. And so I'm looking, you know, basically I can see through the, it's a, you know, there's three holes in the main rotor blade where I used to replace it for a seven thousandths uh, of an inch dent. Now I'm mm-hmm. staring and I can see the sky through it. So because we didn't have any blades and, and we were in a battle, we would take what's called a, gr- we'd take a pencil, we'd break the pencil off in the blade. Mm-hmm. We would cover it with glue, a uh, special <laughs> glue, you know, a fancy glue, mm-hmm. but a glue, no less, sand it down. And then we would mm-hmm. fly it until we could repair it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, I'll let Dustin speak to it, but I was very impressed with the battle damage resistance of this helicopter. It was designed, like he said earlier, redundant systems and to take a pounding. Uh, uh, we had, in my instance, eight, I want to say eight fuel cells that took a bullet through them. They're, they're, now the fuel cells are self-sealing. None of us believe they would. Uh, and 60% of our fuel cells actually did self-seal. Uh, and it just had to do with where the bullet entered, the damage it did, and how much fuel was in it. But mm-hmm. uh, this fuel cell took a, a, a round to it and then healed itself. And so those were all things that I learned later on in my career during the, during, uh, during the war that I was just utterly impressed with Mm -hmm. the resiliency of this aircraft and what it can do. Mm -hmm. Roger, Um, anything for Dustin or we move on? No, I think he covered it. I mean, it's, um, they're not, they can take a little, they can take battle damage. People are, might be surprised to find that the technology though is, is there in a civilian aircraft too. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a honeycomb covered with a metal skin and you'd be surprised how much damage that, uh, that, that can take. And it's, still not lose its structure, structural integrity. The other thing I'll point out that I found surprising too, or, you know, is in Hollywood, uh, obviously you hear the bullets and, and you, you, you know, you're being shot at by a gun. Uh, there were times where dust would come back and it was an uneventful flight. And we, you know, he maybe escorted a Chinook up the Valley and came back and we're standing there talking. And there's two bullet holes in the aircraft. Mm-hmm. As going back to his earlier point, it's so loud. You don't hear it. Mm-hmm. And if there's no tracers, you don't know it. And so inevitably he flew over some village that didn't like him and took a pot shot at him. And, mm-hmm. and we didn't even know he had damage till he landed. And it's like, Oh, huh. Look at that. We, well, we got some work to do. More job. Okay, just, to, just for clarity, I've I've never brought an aircraft back with holes in it. I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm not going to argue, boys. Um, there you go. Next question. Bit weird. Is fast taxi takeoff any good or always vertical? And it's got a picture of a hind taking off, you know, like an aeroplane. Um, what's the what's the answer to that? Uh, so is it, there is an advantage to it. Uh, so I mean, I've said this a lot, it's situational dependent. Uh, we teach, uh, several different types of takeoffs. There's a, you know, we teach a vertical takeoff. We teach uh, what we call a level acceleration takeoff, which is what you're talking about. I think, mm-hmm. uh, it's, uh, it, it's situational dependent. Uh, if the aircraft is heavier then by all means, mm. to get it moving through the air, mm. it's, it's a lot easier to do that with the wheels still on the ground, and it does have a landing gear, and it rolls, so why not use it? Roger. In our MI-8, which is a big, fat transport helicopter, you can load it up in DCS, and um, and it's much easier to take off like that because you can... I think I'm right in saying this. I may be corrected by stalk, but I think by the time you get decent speed running down the runway, you can start using ground effect, um, something along yeah, those lines. Sure. Um, and therefore, you can take off with fifty percent collective rather than a hundred percent collective, or whatever. Yeah. So you you uh, when you're talking helicopter aerodynamics, it's there's there's in ground effect hover and out of ground effect hover, and if you can avoid the out of ground effect hover uh, by taking off in ground effect, uh, like you just mentioned, there's then you're uh, effectively increasing the the maximum capability of the aircraft. Roger. Absolutely. <laughs> want to avoid dead man's curve at all cost. Roger. Uh, I'm tempted to ask what dead man's curve is, but I'm about to run out of time, so I'm going to push on, guys. Um, what we've got here, in Afghanistan, how did you protect the inlets um, from the dust and the sand, or was that taken care of by design? Uh, it's by design. The, uh, a turb- our turbine engines have a, what's it called, what's it called, Chuck, a swirl? Particle separator particle separator but there's, there's a uh, cage around the engine basically mm-hmm. that 
a swirl cage or something like that, right? Yep. They work in conjunction. Swirl cage moves the particles to the outside, centrifugal force, and then the particle separator is actually the vacuum portion that sucks that portion out. Uh, how interesting. So we didn't change anything, uh, but we do avoid landing in the in the dust if we can. Mm. It's a bit like a really high-tech air filter then, whereas you just have some foam or something on a car, but here you could actually centrifugally remove the uh the particles that's really interesting i'd like to re research that at some point okay guys yeah exactly well, oh, lovely very good design um uh, can you tell us a story no we're not allowed to talk about that are we uh can you tell us a story from when you were deployed in af when afghanistan that you will always remember if you want yeah so uh, we sort of told you uh, my christmas story i'll never forget uh doing pedostatic checks mm. uh uh there's a, I got a lot of stories, man. We could talk for hours. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, it, a million come to mind, but like he said, it's always we'll always remember Christmas where all the soldiers are having a good meal and kind of relaxing, and he and I elected to go do a check just to see if the check was the correct check uh, and take nu numerous, it was just geeked out on how to test the aircraft and took numerous notes and, and submitted it to the Army for a change. Roger two peas in a pod okay um pale what was the worst system to work on on the longbow so there's always like uh back in the a model days the uh, ecs was hard to work on uh, i'm sure stalker could tell you about it um but in general there's no worse system i don't think they again now that i know what i know they they do their best to 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 make accessible they again the maintenance is always the the last factor but they, they there is an effort uh, I, I will tell you over the years the rotor head has been a challenge uh, it's just uh, a lot of work goes in there where it, uh, conversely the engine as as dustin pointed out is very strong very reliable very little maintenance uh the rotor head is is where we spend a lot of our time uh trying to ensure it's serviceable and uh and working on it so just uh, spend many a day out in the sun sitting on a rotor head trying to to solve that problem of, of how to get that aircraft fixed roger okay next guys how uh, we've dealt with 33 already 34 how stable was the ah platform in bad weather and severe winds so it's a uh what uh, eighteen thousand pound aircraft so it's typical right um for a mid-weight aircraft it, much more stable than you know most helicopters in numbers but uh, still has it's just it's still susceptible to severe winds for sure I mean, I, I really don't know how to, if you don't have experience flying aircraft, it's hard to explain that. Basically, the heavier the aircraft is, the more stable it becomes, and it's still true for helicopters. Roger. Okay, good answer. Uh, I found it very, uh, in high wind conditions, very unstable when you're inverted. <laughs> inverted. <laughs> yes, yes, you'll know what that means if you fly with him. He's very rarely flying the right way around. Um... How can you automatically, uh, sorry, can you automatically follow terrain in the Apache and can you set it uh, low to the surface? So that's regards radar, is that right, guys, or I got that wrong? So, uh, no, it won't automatically follow terrain. Uh, it, like uh, we, I mentioned before, the radar can see terrain and it'll display it to the pilot, but it isn't necessarily like coupled for any type of terrain following. Roger. Okay. Right. Uh, so we finished the official questions, and that was very good. Just have a, a quick fire um, from guys who may have accumulated questions. Only one from me, and that I've always been interested in the, the design around the f kind of side and front. It's got kind of big cheeks that stick out. I call them like big jowls. What's that? F why is that design feature there? Is that was protective for the pilot, or do you know what I mean? Yeah. So those are what we uh, go ahead and point to it on the on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, so we call those, they were initially called FABs. I forget what FAB stands for, but now we call them EFABs. That's where we keep all of our computers and avionics accessible. So it's on the outside, and uh, you open those panels up, and that's where all the myriad of different computers and stuff that you would access. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it's also there to protect the pilot. It's lower, and so the bullet has further to travel. Mm -hmm. So you put uh, you know, you know, put another piece of equipment between the pilot mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the threat. So uh, I'll let Dustin speak to it. Yeah, it's... 
it's purely for avionics. Uh, if you look at an AH-64 Alpha and then you compare it directly to an AH-64 Delta, you can see that they're very different in size. That and that's that shows you the oh, yeah. technology advance between the Alpha and the Delta. It was purely an avionics advancement. Roger. Uh, so they literally said, okay, I've got all these computers to put in. I need to make them accessible to Pale & Co. Let's put them here. Exactly. It, exact, and they are accessible. Quick open and change. Uh, yeah. Quick release fasteners. And I didn't notice the difference in size, but yeah, that's a great thing to point out. I, I see it now. Interesting. Okay, guys. Now I'm going to hand it over to my boys. My boys, any questions you've accumulated? Chop, chop. Yeah, four minutes. I'll take Send. Um, yeah, I... I messaged you a YouTube link uh, on Discord, well uh, Cap. Uh, the question is, the Apache is fairly renowned in some displays and YouTubes for doing exotic roll and loop maneuvers. The question is, is there any combat value in, in this sort of maneuver, or do you just do it to annoy the maintenance crew? <laughs> well, it definitely does annoy the maintenance crew. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we do teach combat maneuvering uh, for a reason. It's not necessarily to do barrel rolls and loops. Uh, obviously, the air show stuff is for air shows. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you need to turn an aircraft around rapidly, then you need to turn it around rapidly. There's a reason for that. Uh, and so we teach some combat maneuvers, uh, like uh, a pitchback turn. We teach obviously we teach diving flight. Uh, and they're not, they don't look like that YouTube video when you do it at flight school. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the aircraft is fully aerobatic, or at least they, you know, that's the pitch. Uh, and it, it's full, of, depending on how much it weighs, it can do some amazing, incredible things. Uh, and some of those we need, uh, but they're usually uh, far more benign than that. It, when you do the things you need to do, it doesn't look that cool. Roger, that's no, fair. So it's obviously exaggerated for the fans, isn't it? You know, put yeah, the tail up higher, turn around, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions from the guys? Right. Beautiful and amazing timing as well. I've got three minutes to go, and then I've got a uh, I've got a charity event in uh, IO two. So uh, I'm going to have to blast off, guys. Uh, you guys, so if it's up to you, you're welcome to sit and to carry talk on onto the boys. Uh, much appreciated to have you in. Um, and uh, you sound like a couple of proper decent chaps as well that I'd like to have a beer with, but that'll have to wait to another life probably. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's really appreciate to give us uh, give us your time and that. What I'll do is um, I'll get this uh, recorded. If you have anything, any thoughts about anything you want removing from the video, just let me know. Or it didn't sound like there was any much in there, but let me know. Any final comments from Dustin and or Pale? Hey man, uh, thank you appreciate the opportunity uh you guys are doing some cool stuff mm. and uh we're interested in you too uh i just recently started flying dcs yeah. because of bell rider and uh i've been watching a lot of you to your tutorials and it helps mm. me uh, a lot uh so thanks for the opportunity yeah roger Hope to see you guys around yeah remember you're always welcome on because we've got other americans uh, even uh, veteran helicopter pilots that are in our servers and stuff in our discord 24 7 always welcome to hang out we've got a whole bunch of guys we interview now hang out and and fly with us all the time just because we became friends maintainers pilots all sorts of stuff so you're certainly welcome welcome to join the uh, family as i say but um it depends on your commitments and stuff like that but yeah give us a shout if you want to thanks cap it was a blast all right, boys. Thank you very much. And I'll see everyone later. IO2 guys, we've got to head off now. See ya.